baptism, dunking somebody underwater. Where did that come from? What's it all about? Um, it predates Christianity. It's an ancient symbol, something that was done uh, across the board, not only even in um, um, the biblical sense, not only in Judaism, not only in Christianity, but across the board. It was, it was a common symbol. And it's interesting how for thousands of years, this ritual, you could say, or this rite has lasted. It's something that people do across the world. Jesus himself, the son of God, when he became a man, was baptized. He was baptized by the um, prophet John. He was identifying with John's teaching Repent and believe in the Messiah who's coming. This is an ancient and important symbol of agreement and loyalty to the teacher and the teaching. It is, in the plainest sense of the words, immersing oneself into what is being taught in the teacher who's teaching it. We have Jesus who, after being baptized by, by John, launches into a ministry where his message is the same as John's with just a slight twisted change. Instead of repent and believe in the coming gospel, repent and believe in me, I am the gospel. And then we have Jesus telling his disciples, commanding them that one of the chief implications as they go with this gospel, with this message into the world, they are to not only make disciples, make followers of Jesus, but they are to baptize those followers in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. So no longer in the name of John, but now in the name of God's triune being, all three persons of the one triune being. So now no longer is baptism today an identification with uh, the teacher, the one doing the baptizing, because it's not a baptism in the name of Grace Baptist Church or a baptism in the name of Matthew Johnson. It's a baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's identifying in a loyalty to the message and the person of Jesus Christ. This is not a confession of loyalty to a church, of religion, or a human teacher. It is a public confession of Christ. There are three ways baptism is a confession. It is first of all a theological confession. Those being baptized today are saying they are proclaiming um, objective truths. They are saying a theological truth that, there, that forgiveness of sin from the grace of God the Father, through redemption by Jesus Christ, in regeneration by the Holy Spirit. They're saying the triune gospel. That's what they're saying. They're proclaiming an objective truth. It's a theological confession. It is also a personal confession. Not only are they just proclaiming an objective theological truth as we find in the scripture, but they're saying that those things are true of them and for them. It's personal. By grace, through faith, God has miraculously converted me. Jesus paid for my sins. I'm trusting in his life and death and hoping only in the work of his spirit. They're saying, essentially, I once was dead, but now I'm alive. And it is also an identifying confession. I now am forever united to God, reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. And I am marked forever by his Holy Spirit. So the baptism is the individual saying, I know what I'm saying, and I'm saying this. I am loyal to Jesus. I'm with Jesus. I'm with him. What is it not? It is not a conferment of grace. God is not more inclined towards you in a favorable sense, more accepting because of baptism. Acceptance is only in Jesus Christ. It is not a conferment of grace. It is not a making of sinless. Those individuals who will be symbolically dunked into water today will not come out of that water suddenly having leveled up in their spiritual life. Was, was pretty sinful at 10 o'clock this morning 
And now that I've got this water on me, I'm relatively sinless. If that is what you think, just wait till 12 o'clock and you'll find out you're not relatively sinless. It is not making of one sinless. It does not put one on a higher, more successful spiritual plane. As if I was, I, was, I was really wandering until I finally got baptized, then everything just changed for me. The flesh is actually stronger, if not more visceral, upon the rising from baptismal waters. Well, fight. It also is not a culmination of faith. It is not the end of the Christian experience, but the beginning. Now, one must have a mental and emotional understanding and maturity to be baptized, I believe, but not a spiritual maturity. This is why I discourage children's baptisms, not because they can't or don't believe, but because of the mental and natural immaturity in understanding all of this. But understand that saying that, it, baptism is not a rite or a demonstration of spiritual arrival. You don't work your whole life to grow so that one day you can be baptized when you finally spiritually attained something. No, it's not that at all. In fact, thinking of that idea of growth and spiritual improvement, sanctification, I wanted to read you a passage of Scripture from Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. Paul, the greatest leader in church history, describes his gospel ministry and purpose and goal in these passages. He says, Him, that's Jesus Christ, we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. That, so that, we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. This is what Paul was saying. He was saying, here's my method of ministry, preaching, warning, teaching. It's what I do. Here's my manner of ministry. Every man in all wisdom. That's all divine truth. And here's his purpose. So that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, mature, complete. When is that presentation take place? That presentation that Paul is referring to does not take place at the baptismal waters. That present takes place at the judgment seat of Christ in eternity. And so what he's essentially saying here is my purpose, my goal, my end of all ministry is to be able to stand before Christ at the last day with those whom I have taught and to be able to see them there with me and to say, here they are. Here they are. In a sense, Paul was saying, I minister for the day of people's death. That's what I minister toward. That's what I'm looking toward. Beloved, the day of your baptism, specifically those being baptized today, the day of your baptism is a special day, but it is not the most important day as it relates to your faith. The most important day of, as it relates to your faith is the day of your death and the judgment on that day. You see, starting a race with vitality and enthusiasm is not nearly as important as finishing the race with endurance and patience. Many begin as Christians with wonderful baptisms and feasts and celebrations only to leave Christ and the gospel as life becomes wearisome and dangerous and painful. Might I say that the day that you are laid in the coffin is mar far more significant day than the day you were laid beneath baptism's waters. Loyalty, confession of Christ, which is what the baptism symbolizes is at the end of life is the fullest evidence that the loyalty and confession of Christ at baptism is indeed true. That concept that the day of our death is a far more significant day as it relates to our faith than the day of our, of our baptism ought to permeate our thinking. Many have been waylaid in their spiritual walk because they've thought, if I just get baptized, everything will work out. 
If I just go to church, if I just give this money to this group, if I just do this, then everything's going to smooth out in my walk. What needs to happen when I'm struggling with sin, I just need to maybe get dunked. But the reality is, faith that is given by the Spirit of God must be an enduring faith if it is to be any faith at all. Must be an enduring faith. That brings us to Hebrews 11 in the text we're at today. Hebrews 11 verse 35. This is the end of the text. This is the end of the great chapter on people of faith. People who perhaps experienced great baptismal days. This is what it says. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Here's the text of God's word. This is God's inspired, inerrant word. We ought to listen carefully to it. These heroes of faith, those who esteemed the reproach of Christ greater treasures than that of Egypt, like Moses, they never met Christ personally, humanly in their lives. And he's describing their endurance, even though they're holding out this hope for Christ. And as he's gone through the text, we've gone through it already, he speaks of the well-known, right? Like Abraham and Moses and Noah. But he also speaks to the unknown, like Jephthah and Rahab and Enoch. And one of the things we learned as we went through this Hebrews chapter 11 is that the strength or the amount of their faith is not the most significant thing. The presence of faith, simple faith, in an all-powerful God is all that was necessary. We also learned as we went through this chapter over the last couple months that true faith is always connected and comes from revelation of God. They weren't called to blindly trust in something somewhere at some time, but they were called to believe the very plainly given words of God. Faith is simply taking God at his word. Not taking God of what, at what he might say or might do or what may perhaps happen, but taking God in what he has said he does and will do. The commands and promises of God is the basis of faith. We saw that through this text over and over again. But the other overriding principle, the one that he emphasizes as he comes to the end of the text, is faith must be enduring to be true faith at all. That's the last part of this chapter as he transitions from the miraculous power of faith in verses 30 through 35 to now faith's power to enable God's people to suffer, to endure, to experience great pain and great loss. And he does this in this really powerful, intentionally provocative way in verse 35. Did you notice it? He ends the miraculous portion by saying this, women received their dead, raised to life again. So he talks about all the miracles of faith, like the Red Sea crossing and the falling of the walls of Jericho. And then he gives the one that is just amazing. He says, and people even came back from the dead. And of course, I think he's talking about in there the women who received their dead, raised to life again. I think he's talking about, in a, by not mentioning their name, but the widows of uh, the underneath Elijah and Elisha. He's talking about them, I think. 
And the emphasis here is that even this happened and they believed God and saw God do amazing things. But do you notice the intentional and shocking twist? Others died and didn't raise from the dead. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, deliverance in this life. In other words, they were tortured to death. So he's putting these in a juxtaposition. Some received their dead raised to life and some didn't. Why not? Well, we don't know. The text doesn't answer why they didn't. And that's one of the things about suffering that the Bible is replete with examples. And probably the best case of this is the book of Job. Where you read the book of Job and Job never found out why him, why me was never answered for Job. And that is often the way it is with why did some receive the dead raised to life again, but others didn't. Sovereignty of God. Perfection and intentionality of God's ultimate divine glorifying purposes. But why did that not bother them should be the bigger question. Not why did it not happen that way, but why were they okay with God not raising their loved ones or themselves from the dead? That's what he's addressing in the text, right? Why did they not accept deliverance? Why did it not bother them that God didn't do this miracle he did for them to them? It says this, so that they might receive a better resurrection. So I don't believe this is saying that they thought, if I get raised now, or if my child gets raised now, that's the only one, they'll never get raised again. You get one shot at a resurrection. And if you get it, you know, in this life, that's it. If you, you know, like poor Lazarus, he got the resurrection and then he never, you know, that's it for him. I don't think that's what the text is saying. I don't think he's putting, pitting them against each other, the resurrection, the ones that were raised from the dead. I mean, those poor kids, those widows' kids, they got raised, then they never had any spiritual hope after that. No, that's not it. What I think he is saying is that they had in their minds, this is the way they thought, why would I settle for a resurrection in this life when there's a better resurrection in the life to come? Why would I settle to be raised from the dead and delivered from my torment just so I can be tormented again tomorrow. Why would I settle for that? Because you see, and I think, think of a New Testament example of Lazarus. I do feel so sorry for that guy. I mean, he rose again and he still got sick. And he still had people call him nasty things. And he still, this is the worst of all, he still called other people nasty things. In other words, he rose again, but he still had the sinful flesh. He rose into corruption. So that might be nice, but that's not good enough. That's not good enough. I mean, when I get raised again, I want to get raised again into incorruption. I want this gone. I don't like me. And I don't want me like this forever. I want a new me. And I don't like this body. And not because it's hard to lose weight. or It's hard because I get injured when I try to play sports. I don't like this body because of what's inside of it. Because there's this sinful, constant battle. And the better resurrection is the one where when you rise again, that's gone. And that's what they thought. That's what they believed. What God had taught about the resurrection. What was Stephen, the first martyr, thinking when they threw massive stones on his head? Why did his faith not fail in that moment? He saw the Son of God welcoming him into heaven, and he believed he was owed by God's grace in Jesus a better resurrection. What about James, the first disciple to have been martyred? First of the twelve. Why, when they rushed him to the top of the temple mount to throw him off, and he was leaning over the edge, knowing that he was going to die and it was going to be messy, 
Why did he not suddenly fall to his knees and plead for deliverance? Because he believed, you can throw me off. That just means I get a better resurrection. And why did Polycarp, John's disciple, and much, time, much later, John Huss and William Tyndale, who all shared the same fate of fire, as they piled wood beneath their feet to burn them for Christ's sake. Why did they in that moment not start pleading for deliverance? Why did Huss say, I am ready to die today? Why did Tyndale's last words say, open the eyes of the king of England? Why? Because they understood that by faith their eyes might close in death and the fire would burn them in deep pain, but they would never face fire again. A better resurrection awaited them. And in our generation even, why did Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCauley, Pete Fleming, and Roger Udarian, missionaries who were going to bring the gospel for the first time to the headhunters of the Aka Indians in Ecuador. Why did they, when they landed their plane and they began to make this contact they'd been praying for to bring the gospel, and they were met by groups of the, the natives coming toward them, and they had a firearm with them. Why did they not shoot the firearm at them? but instead welcomed a death where all five of them were mercilessly slaughtered, men with wives and children. Why did they not accept deliverance? They believed that they would find a better resurrection in Christ. In fact, Jim Elliott said it before this day. He said this, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Dying in this life is nothing compared to rising in the next. And why two years ago did Pastor Jean-Paul Sankaguay in Bangwai, Central African Republic, refuse to leave his church family as they put a bullet in his head, the Islamists put a bullet in his head and they burned his property to the ground. He had children and a wife. Why did he refuse? Why would he not accept deliverance? Because he believed that a better resurrection was already his. Why is it that an average of 11 people die every day for the cause of Christ? Not to mention the many who survive and don't die and yet are tortured and persecuted and destitute and afflicted and tormented and living in dens and caves of the earth. Why? By faith, they do not accept deliverance because they believe in a better resurrection. Now we understand, as i reading through this, I understand why he pauses in the midst of all of his statements about the afflictions. And he, he talks about many of them. Mockings and scourgings and chains and imprisonments and stonings and being cut in two. And being slain with the sword and wandering in sheepskins and, and goatskins and being destitute. That means friendless. No one with them. Why does he pause as he's listing all of these ways in which God's people did not accept deliverance? And then he says, of whom the world is not worthy. Because they believe in a better resurrection. The world hates God's people because they think that the people of God are not worthy of this fantastic world. But the opposite is true. This world is not worthy and never has been worthy of the condescension of the eternal God to it. And the uniting together people within it. As Jesus told those at his trial, my people are not of this world. They would fight if they were. There's a kingdom that my people are a part of that's not of this world. And quite frankly, ever since Abel's blood was spilled, 
this world has been unworthy of those in whom Christ has dwelt. This world was then and it is today unworthy of these people. They think they do a great service to the world by eradicating and hating God's people, but they do a great disservice to their own world, but actually a great service to God's people. Because these individuals who tortured and killed and murdered in this passage were simply the means of God by which he brings about a better resurrection for his people. So fear not, faithful and beloved, because the day of your death is when life really begins. This is a shadowy blip on the radar of eternity. This really doesn't matter that much. Life begins the day you die. Life begins that day. Real life. A life of resurrected. And so he gives here in Hebrews 11 at the very end, these final words of encouragement after listing those who endured until the end, whose faith lasted. And he gives this, he says, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect or complete Apart from us. So he said, these all retained a good witness, a good testimony. At the end of their life, their faith endured. The Holy Spirit preserved them in faith. God in his sovereign grace did not allow his elect to fall. He held them fast. Good witness. The baptism today is a good witness. But it's not the good witness being spoken of here. The good witness is the day of your funeral. That's what he's describing. He said they had a good witness through faith, but they did not receive the promise. So what is this promise that they did not receive? First of all, it cannot be, because he's talking about the Old Testament saints, it cannot be the land of Canaan. Why? Because they did receive that promise, right? Right? They settled in the land. So it can't be the land of promise. They did not receive Canaan. No, because we have this, all of these that he's describing here did not receive the promise. It also cannot be heaven. Because we know they received heaven. I have one specific scripture that tells me that all of these, especially one particular individual in here that did receive heaven. Moses. Right? Right? Because when Jesus is transfigured on the mountain, who appears with him? Who appears, who comes down from heaven? Moses and Elijah. In other words, they received that promise, right? So that can't be the promise he's talking about. It says they did not receive the promise. So it's not Canaan and it's not heaven. So what is the promise he's talking about? God gave many promises to his people. But there was one particular promise that all of the Old Testament points toward. That one particular promise is the incarnation of the Son of God himself. Everything points to that promise. That's the ultimate promise, right? We've looked at the covenants before. We've seen how they all point to that promise, that one. That's the promise he's talking about. He says, so these all died. You know, Moses never did see in his lifetime the incarnation, the Son of God, the fulfillment of that promise to Adam and Eve. Neither did Abraham, neither did Isaac, neither did Jacob. Neither did Daniel and David. They didn't get to see that. They didn't get to enjoy fellowship with the sea. And see, it's kind of like they, they, they were giving birth, but they never got to see the joy of that giving birth. Right? They never got to see the, the final installment. They never got to see the descended Christ. Why not? Have you ever wondered that? Why didn't God, you know, just, why didn't the Messiah come as the, third son of Adam and Eve. I mean, we'd be a whole lot better off today, right? If, if, if we just stop it there. 
Or, or why, not, why not the Messiah instead of Solomon? Right? The son of David. Wouldn't that have been nice if Solomon wasn't Solomon? And if instead the perfect peaceful reign was not just the time of Solomon, but was then af- forever after that? Why not? And, and why not Isaac? Why couldn't he have been the Messiah? Why couldn't it not have been Isaac and it have been Jesus that came, right, you know, as Abraham's descendant? This is what the text is talking about. Why not? Why did they not receive the promise? And this is what it says here. Because God had provided something better for us. Now, in the context, he's talking about the people, uh, in the New Testament people, right? He's talking about these Hebrews he's writing the letter to. Those that had seen the Christ. And they'd seen his death, resurrection, and ascension. This is when he's writing it. He said, God had provided something better for us. What is that? What is the something better? The something better is the family of faith. Because he says this, that they, not talking about individually, but corporately, they, the whole of them, should not be made complete apart from us. You know why God didn't end it all and bring in the final eternal state after Adam and Eve's sin? For you. That's why he didn't. You know why it wasn't Solomon? Because there were many, many people of God's sovereign elect who he desired and longed for to be a part of his eternal family. Because God is eternal patient and long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but desiring all to come to repentance. And because his family, whatever that is going to look like, his family is going to be a multitude of people redeemed by the blood of the land out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, people, and nation, every color, every ethnicity, every, every spectrum you can imagine. And he has this massive, eternal, sovereign wisdom. He has this massive family. And he says, not yet. Not yet. There's more I've got planned to come. That's why not only did they not see the promise of Christ's incarnation, but we today have not yet seen the fulfillment of Christ's promise of return. I mean, isn't that what you're praying for? And isn't it right, according to the book of Revelation, to pray, come quickly, Lord? I mean, it's right to pray that. But what if he doesn't? I mean, what if, what if he decides to wait another thousand years? I mean, well, it's, that's easy for us to say that's okay. What if he decides to wait the rest of your life and you die and you don't get to see him come? You know, I, I think a part of me goes, but I want it for me. <laughs> I want the end. I want, I want it I want for my children. But, but you understand that if he tarries, if he does not return now and he spares and he continues on, it's because his family is not complete yet. It's because there is more to come after you. And so that the world was not worthy of the enduring faith and the death of these people. As faithful as they were, they died not having received the promise of the Messiah. And we saw a half of the promise, but we haven't seen the whole promise yet because the Messiah hasn't come back in his conquering king yet. Two parts to his coming, right? Two parts to his incarnation. And why and how long do we must continue? Because God's Family's not big enough yet. That's why. Well, how big is it going to get? I don't know. I'm not supposed to know. What am I supposed to be and do? Hebrews 11, 35 through 40, or 38, that's what I'm supposed to be and do, right? Look toward the better resurrection and endure in faith in Christ today. And when he says, it's time for you to face the fires, to say, all right, bring the fires. That's so hard. It's so easy to say, so hard to imagine doing. I don't want to say that flippantly. But God give each one of us the faith, especially those being baptized today, to be willing to be plunged beneath something worse than water. Because there's a better resurrection. There's a bigger family. 
And God is sovereignly at work enlarging his family in Christ. You could even say it this way. God has provided something better for them so that we, our family, should not be made complete apart from them. I mean, aren't you thankful today as an English speaker that William Tyndale suffered what he suffered so that you could hold in your hands God's revelation to you? Aren't you thankful that Paul the Apostle experienced the suffering, the pain, the affliction so that he could bring the gospel outside the walls of Jerusalem? Eventually across the ocean? So then can we not endure praying that God would use whatever affliction comes our way for them, whoever they may be, that should come after. This is what he is saying in the text here. And I decided to continue in this baptism service preaching through Hebrews 11 because it fits so perfectly in preparing to be immersed under the waters to recognize what I said in the beginning is true now. This day is significant and important both as those being baptized and those witnessing the baptism. But your faith today, your loyalty to Christ today, is not the end. It is the beginning. May we be so enraptured by the gospel of Jesus Christ that every one of us would run toward the gallows would run toward the fires would run toward the chains not accepting deliverance because we are hoping We are believing, we are trusting in a better resurrection. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to move um, toward the time of celebrating baptism. Let's pray.